you know why this picture here is, is important? Why it's important to me? I want, I want you to look, at, um, look at, the, at the very center. You see Billy Good in the middle there? You see Billy? You guys know Billy Good? Yeah. This picture right here was the first day, not the last day, but the first day that Billy Good stuck her finger in the middle of my cake. <laughs> not the last day it happened, but this was the first day. This, this was taken on the day when I was installed as, as pastor here at First Baptist Church. And they had a reception after the service that day. And so this was taken at the reception. And I got to tell you guys, uh, throughout the entire interview process that I went through, so throughout the discernment process, throughout worship that morning, throughout my whole time waiting in line that morning, nobody ever mentioned to me that there was this lady named Billy Good who had a habit of sticking her finger in the cake of people that she was welcoming to the church. And so you can imagine my surprise when I see this seemingly sweet lady coming up to me, looking like she wants to give me a hug, and then goes knuckle deep in my carrot cake. Yeah. That was the beginning of my story here at First Baptist Church. And, and the reason I'm sharing that is that that moment, that moment when I had that interaction with Billy Good, that helped to define how I knew her and how I related to her and how I interacted with her. And even now, seven years later, I know Billy Good as someone who is playful. Someone who is mischievous, right? Someone who is comfortable being around people. But it was that interaction with her that helped to define my story with her. You know, isn't that interesting? I still ate the cake that day, by the way. Still ate the cake. I, I probably should have asked her if she'd washed her hands. I didn't think to ask that. A little state of shock. Has she stuck her finger in other people's cake here? Or is it just me? Okay, Gino, Bruce, good. Tommy, good. Okay, so other people have had the same experience as me. Um, on, on your program, on the front of your program, it says, this is my story. This is my story. And this is a theme that we have been following over the last couple of weeks here. We've, we've talked about the way, that, the way that God has been active in our stories, sometimes and very often in ways that we're not even aware of, right? That, that, that we go through these periods of time, we're not even aware that God is there. And certainly God has been active in our story far longer than we've known about. I mean, even before we were born, God has been a part of our story. But last week, we talked about what, what it means when, when Jesus comes into our story as Lord. And, and I'm guessing, I'm betting that it probably didn't happen by him sticking his finger in your cake. But just as that incident, you know, identified Billy Good to me and, and really identified our story together, I'm hoping that when Jesus came into your story, that it, it affected the way that you relate to him and it affected the way that he has been a part of, a part of your story. And so last week, we started talking about, um, the challenge was, was what does is, what is your story story look like in light, of, in light of Jesus being there? How does your faith story been impacted by him? And even if you weren't here last week, you can still think about that, of course, because the, the question that we're looking at is, how is my story different because of him? How is my story different because of Jesus being in my life? How is my story different because of him? And, and you know, to be honest with you, some of us, some of us may not be able to answer that yet. Some of us may not really have an answer to that. And I, I want to tell you something, that's okay. Every single one of us is given the opportunity to experience the, the power and the presence of Jesus uniquely. It's different for all of us. And the journey of experiencing that, of exploring that and building that relationship is such a beautiful gift. The journey itself is a beautiful gift. So listen, guys, don't let anyone ever rush you or push you or guilt you if your story does not match theirs in terms of the timing of it and in terms of what it looks like, okay? Your story is your story with him. Now, having said that, those of us who profess 
faith in Jesus as Lord, when we understand who Jesus is as Lord of our lives, the question that we really want to ask though is, is how does my story look different and how does my purpose look different because of his presence? What's different about my story when he came into it? Because uh, to be honest with you, I mean truthfully, the story doesn't change that much if Jesus comes in as your friend. Your story doesn't change that much if he's there as your teacher, if he's a guide, if he's a good example. It doesn't change all that much. But when Jesus comes into my story as my redeemer, as the source of my salvation, as my rock, my way, my truth, my life, when he has that role, my story has to change. And so that's what we're wrestling with, okay? And so what I want us to look at today is I want to look at an example of someone whose story changed when Jesus came in, all right? And so to look at that, I want us to, to take a look in the Bible together at a passage from Mark chapter five, Mark chapter five. So if you've got a Bible, take a look, flip back there to Mark five, it's in the back in the New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, we've got these in front of you, love to have you use them. Uh, Mark five is on page 833 in, the, in these blue Bibles, it's on page 1542 in the large print, large print Bibles, page 833, 1542, Mark chapter, chapter five. The same, you could find the same story in Luke's gospel and in Matthew's gospel, the story that we're looking at today. So if you, if you want later on, you can go back and you can compare them and see a couple slight differences, but the, the gist of the story is, is really the same. Before this, before this story happens, uh, Jesus has been teaching the crowds and helping them understand who God is and, and, and what God's role is in their life. And then when he's done teaching by the lake, that he and the disciples cross the lake in, the, in a boat, and this huge storm comes up, and it's rocking the boat, and, and Jesus calms the storm. Okay, so this is what's happened right before. You can read about that in Mark 4 if you want to. But it's interesting that this story follows right after that because Jesus has displayed the wisdom that comes from God and the power that comes from God in teaching and in, in calming the storm. And now he displays the authority that comes from God in this next story. So this is what happens right after they get to the other side of the lake in chapter 5. It says this. So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerasenes, when Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from a cemetery to meet him. This man had lived among the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and he smashed the shackles, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him and ran to meet him and bowed low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be some, a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirit begged. Let us enter them. And so Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. And the herdsmen who were watching the pigs fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there, fully clothed and perfectly sane. And they were all afraid. And those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs, and the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. I want, I'm going to pause for one second there. I, th I find it interesting in the story, um, the, the people who share what happened about Jesus. There's two times in this story when people share the message, share the story. And the first one you see is right there in verse 14 where it says, the herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. What do you think they were saying about Jesus? What do you think their message was as, as they were? Was it a good message or a bad message? 
Scared. scared. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's kind of hard to say what they were saying, right? Because they had just seen this incredible miracle, this guy delivered from these demons. But of course, at the same time, their entire herd of 2,000 pigs was gone because of Jesus, right? So you kind of wonder what they were saying. Whatever they said as they ran, these crowds came to see Jesus, and, and they, they weren't sure how to take him. They, the crowds asked him to leave because they're scared. Maybe they're unsure what Jesus' purpose is. Maybe they think he's going to get rid of their animals. I, I don't know. We don't really know exactly what, what the crowd was thinking, but they want him to leave. So they, they come as a result of these herdsmen telling the story of what happened. The other time you hear someone tell the story, though, is, is from the man who was healed. So take a look at what happens at the end of that section. It says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. And so the man started off to visit the 10 towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things that Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. So what do you think his message was? <laughs> Awesome, right? I mean, his, his message had to be different from the herdsman, right? The herdsman had seen something happen to this guy, but this guy had experienced it. He had this personal, firsthand encounter with Jesus, and it changed him. And when you think about how he responded, it's probably pretty normal how he responded, right? Let me come with you, Jesus. I don't care where you're going in that boat. Let me come with you. And Jesus says to him, no, stay and tell your story. I want to come with you. No, stay and tell your story. You, you know what's really cool? You and I are invited to do both. We're invited to come with him, and we're also invited to tell our story. And so two questions, I think, come out of this for me. What does our story look like, and who are we supposed to tell our story to? What does your story look like, and who are you supposed to tell your story to? Last week, I, I handed out a, a piece of paper that had, said my story on it, right? And, and the purpose of that, it was just to help us start to verbalize um, what your story looks like, what your faith story looks like. If you didn't get one of those pieces of paper or, you know, God forbid, threw it away, um, and you want another one, there's more on the table back there, and you, you're welcome to pick one up if you want. But the purpose of that is just to help us kind of think through what our encounter with Jesus looks like, because it's unique to you. There is no way that you can copy somebody else's story and call it yours. Nobody else had an encounter like this with Jesus. That was his story, and you have your own story. So you may or may not need a piece of paper like that. But for those of us who don't really know how to talk about our experience with Jesus, it might help just to answer some questions that are on that sheet of paper so that you understand what your story looks like. Because I, I guarantee you that your story with Jesus does not look like mine. Your story does not look like the person sitting next to you. This man had a unique story, and it was his. You have a unique story with Jesus, and it's yours. The goal is to become comfortable with learning how to tell that story, okay? So when you're trying to figure out what your story's like, you may want to use a piece of paper to help that, write down some notes, but start to kind of think about what your story looks like, because it's going to be unique to you. You can't borrow somebody else's. You can't have somebody else's story. Yours is a gift to you, okay? The other question, though, is who am I supposed to tell my story to? And this one, I, I, I got to tell you, I think it's, it's a little more difficult. This question's a little more difficult because there's an obvious answer when you think about who am I supposed to tell? The obvious answer is everyone. <laughs> I'm supposed to tell everyone. And there's some truth to that. God does want, he wants everyone to know about his love and he wants to know, everyone to know about the grace that he has towards the world. God so loved the world. So we're supposed to tell everyone. But I got to tell you guys, it, it's intimidating to think that I am supposed to tell everyone everyone my story. That's intimidating. Not only is it scary for me to think that I've got to tell everybody about my experience with Jesus, but it just seems impossible when I'm looking at the world that I'm supposed to tell everybody my story, or even to narrow it down to say this country or this state 
or this city or even my school or my job or my neighborhood. It's intimidating to think that I'm supposed to tell everyone my story of Jesus. And I have a feeling it was probably intimidating for this guy who was healed in the story today too. And I think that this is why Jesus says to him, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how mercifully, merciful he has been. And I'm thinking that there's two reasons that Jesus sends him home to his family. And when we look at the reasons, it can maybe help us understand who Jesus wants us to tell our story to. Okay? The first reason that I think Jesus sends the man back to his family is that they were the ones who were close to him already. They were the ones that he was familiar with. They were the ones who were in his circle. They were the ones that he was comfortable with. And so if the guy had to start telling this incredible story, it would make sense to tell the people who were near him first. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, if you and I, if we have a story like this to share, starting with the people who are already in our lives, people we're comfortable with, people who are safe, is a good place to start. And I'll tell you something, that may or may not be your family. I mean, I hate to say it, but sometimes our family, sometimes they're not the safe ones. It's not supposed to be that way, but it's true. It's just a reality. But the same truth applies. The list of people that you have in your life, and I want you to think about this, the list of people in your life, your friends, your family members, your classmates, your coworkers, your online acquaintances are absolutely unique to you. Your spouse does not have the same list. Your best friend does not have the same list. Your list is unique, and that is no accident. God has placed those people in your life, and he has placed you in their lives for a reason. So when you start thinking about how to tell your story, the story of your faith, it makes sense to start with the people that you are already comfortable with the people who are already in your lives, okay? So I think the goal for us would be to make a list of maybe five people or maybe 10 people or 20 people that you already know, people that you're pretty comfortable with and start to practice your story. Start even with the, the top three or four people that you're really comfortable with and even if they know your story, it doesn't matter. Listen, if they already know your story, use them to practice on. Just get comfortable talking, and as you get comfortable, you can start expanding that out to more and more people. And the guy in the story does that, right? He goes around, and he's spreading the news in the marketplace, and, and people are amazed, but Jesus tells him first to go where? To his family, to the people that he was close to, the people that were already in his circle. And I think we're supposed to do the same thing. I think we're supposed to start with people that we are close to, the people who are already in our lives, and get comfortable telling our story there first. The second reason that I think that Jesus sends him to his family is that they were the ones who needed to hear about this transformation that he had gone through. This man had been freed from his imprisonment and he was sent to help free his family from whatever imprisonment they were facing themselves. For him, it was demons, right? He was, he was imprisoned by demons, but maybe his family was imprisoned by, by addictions, or maybe his family was imprisoned by hopelessness or by a missing sense of, of purpose. And this man had experienced release, and now he's being sent to his family because they needed release also. And now this guy had the answer. You, the, your story of your interaction with Jesus is different from my story. Some of us here have been, have been freed from, from drugs. Some of us here ha have been freed from abuse. Some of us here have been freed from pride or from anger or from depression or addiction. And whatever your individual story is with Jesus, however Jesus has interacted in your life, you have been uniquely equipped to reach people in similar circumstances. Okay? So if, if Jesus, if you used to struggle with addictions before Jesus, the people who need to hear your story are people who struggle with addictions now. 
If Jesus freed you and delivered you from anger and resentment, if you used to be an angry and just resentful person, I bet you know some angry, resentful people right now that could benefit from hearing your story. Every single one of us has a unique story to share. And so as you think about the, way, the people that God is trying to reach you, through you, Start with the people that are already close to you. Start with the people that are in your circle and start with the people that are struggling with the same things that you used to struggle with. Because if your story now points to him, those are the people that are gonna be most responsive to it. Now, next thing that we have to talk about is knowing when and how to tell the story. Knowing when to tell the story and knowing how to tell our story. So, guess what we're going to talk about next week? Knowing when and how to tell our story. But what I want you guys to do this week, and I want you to think about the one person in your life that you are closest to. The one person that you're most comfortable with. And think about how you would share your story with that person this week. What would it look like? What would it sound like? If that's the most comfortable person in your life, start there and practice on them. Because I'll tell you something, you never know. That may be precisely the person that God wants you to reach first. I'm going to invite you to pray with me this morning as our ushers come up. Gracious God, we are so blessed to have our own story with Jesus, our own experience, our own relationship. Our responsibility, God, is not to create a carbon copy story in others. Our responsibility is simply to use our story to show how freeing Jesus is, what kind of a difference he can make, and how loved we are because of him. So God, lead us to one or two people this week that, that need to hear our story and teach us to express it in a way that is comfortable and brings you glory. God, as we give our gifts to this morning, create generosity in us, remind us that we have nothing, we have nothing that did not come from your hand. And so as we give, lead us to be generous as you have been generous with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.